So uh, it is a, a great pleasure to be here with you today. Um, and I'd like to start by congratulating the experts and the jury for the uh, consensus conference uh, document, which is really a rigorous and visionary uh, review of the state of psychological treatments in anxiety and depression at the moment, and an impressive call for action in many areas of healthcare in order to further improve the offer to the Italian public. And this is really very exciting. Um, some of the documents that the experts and the jury looked at were based on the English Improving Access to Psychological Therapies program. And I'm going to be telling you about that today. Um, but every country is different. And I know you won't want to just copy the IAP program. That's not right for Italy. But I hope some of the things that we have done will be of interest as you further develop your own help for people with common mental health problems. So IAP stands for Improving Access to Psychological Therapies. And it was created to address an injustice. In 2004, our clinical guideline body, uh, the National Institute for Care and Clinical Excellence, NICE, started issuing guidelines on the treatment of mental health problems. And it stated very clearly that for common mental health problems, anxiety and depression, first choice treatments should include evidence-based psychological therapies, as well as medication. And surveys showed that this recommendation was very popular with the public. Some members of the public say, give me the drugs. But on a ratio of three to one, the public prefers psychological therapies. But in the United Kingdom, when we started in 2007, less than 5% of members of the public were getting an evidence-based psychological therapy for depression or anxiety. Somewhat more people were getting some psychological intervention, but it was often not evidence-based. And the waits to start treatment were very long indeed, uh, over a year often. In fact, I think it was fair to say in no country in the world was the public getting what it wanted because nowhere were psychological therapies more available than medication. So the IAPT solution has been to train a large number, currently about 10,000 <coughs> psychological therapists in um, evidence-based treatments following national training curricula with all the courses um, following a similar training in the different modalities. And before people have finished the course, we check their competence in delivering the treatments through videotapes of live therapy sessions, as well as many other assessments. And then they are deployed in new stepped care psychological therapy services. NICE recommended that for many of the people with more mild to moderate symptoms, a low intensity psychological intervention, low intensity in terms of therapist time might be appropriate. 
such as guided self-help or computerized cognitive behavior therapy. So many people start with that. But for the more severe cases, and also for people who do not fully respond to the low intensity intervention, they are stepped up to more traditional once a week uh, psychological therapy. This is an efficient way of delivering the service to a large number of people. And each of the services ensures that every therapist has clinical supervision on their cases every week and also has access to further training every year to expand their skills. And a key feature of the program is to try to measure and publicly report the clinical outcomes of every single patient who has a course of therapy. Of course, we don't report in the public domain individuals' outcomes, but we report the outcome of a whole service. This program was based on sound clinical arguments, and I presented them to the government, but also crucially on economic arguments, which were presented by um, Lord Layard, who is here, a well-known economist. What were the arguments? Well, the main arguments are summarized in uh, the book that Richard Layard and I wrote called Thrive, which is it published in Italian in a month or so, and Giovanni Ruggieri here will tell you more about uh, that. Um, and also it's published in Dutch, you'll see. So you can read the arguments in detail for yourself in Italian. The key points though are, is it costs the nation a very large amount of money not to deliver psychological therapies? This is because untreated anxiety and depression reduces the size of your economy by four percentage points, which in Italy is a very large amount of money. And that's unnecessary though, because we do know that you can train therapists in routine services to deliver treatments effectively. You'll see this in a moment in the IAP program. We also know that you can monitor outcomes on everyone to check that if the government invests money, they get the return they expect in terms of health benefits. And also, that if economic times are difficult, and they are for many of us at the moment, it is economic madness not to do the program. And that is because it saves you money, not costs you money. Because if we help people to recover from their anxiety and depression, they cost less money in terms of their physical health care. So there's a saving to our healthcare system. Also, many more people get back into work. And when they are in work, they're more productive because their mind is not on their worries and their depression. And both of these save society more money than it costs to deliver the IAP program, which would be on average about 10 sessions. So those were the arguments. The program started in 2008, and it now sees about 1 million people a year in the services. They all get a careful assessment, but then not everyone requires treatment. Some people need some simple advice. Some other people, it turns out their problem is not anxiety or depression. It might be psychosis or eating disorders and they need to be referred elsewhere. Um, but currently, we give a course of psychological treatment to about 660,000 people every year. And we manage to collect outcome data 
on 99% of that 660,000 people using a session by session outcome monitoring system. Um, the average wait to start treatment is now not one year, it's 20 days. So a big improvement. And the clinical outcomes that we now achieve are roughly in line with the research studies. So when we started the program, I promised the Minister for Health that if we did it well, we should be able to get 50% of people to fully recover from their anxiety and depression and many more show benefit. So here on this graph, that is the 50% target. And the government announced that target. As you can see, at the beginning, we did not achieve the target. We were well below, uh, about 37% of people fully recovering. But you see, as time went on, and we collected the data and learned from it, we gradually got better and better. And for the last seven years, every year, we have exceeded that 50% recovery target. And you can see that now round about 70% of people are showing significant benefit. Um, so what's happened there? How have we learned? Well, um, really collecting the data has been very important because we've learned a lot from it, as you will see. But before I go on to that, I should say a little bit about what are the treatments. So the low intensity treatments tend to be based on uh, forms of cognitive behavior therapy. Um, the high intensity treatments are quite varied. Uh, NICE recommends a range of different psychological therapies for depression, and we try and support them all. So uh, as well as cognitive behavior therapy, which accounts for just over half of the high intensity therapies, we also have counseling, uh, couples therapy, uh, interpersonal psychotherapy, and brief psychodynamic psychotherapy available for treating depression. Um, for PTSD, as well as CBT, we have EMDR as well. But NICE recommends largely CBT for anxiety disorders. So for the anxiety disorders, that's largely what we offer. Um, what have we learned from the data? Well, you can read um, the IAP manual, which summarizes a lot of the key learning. It's available free on this NHS England website. Um, what I'd like to illustrate here, though, is how things have changed with time. So this dotted line here is the overall recovery rate for the whole of England. And you can see back in 2015, it was at 45%, not as high as we would like. But over the next five years, it gradually increased uh, to over our 50% target. What I've plotted here, though, is the performance of those services that were in the bottom 10% in terms of outcomes and also in the top 10%. And you can see over this time, the poor performing services are the ones that have improved most. They've shown a very big improvement in their outcomes. And so the difference in outcomes between the bottom 10% of services and the top 10% was about 20 percentage points in 2015, but is now only 10 percentage points. So we've been able to ensure high quality services throughout the country. What are some of the lessons that we've learned from the data? Well, an early finding was that patients get better outcomes if you give them the nice recommended treatment. So in depression, NICE recommends counseling and CBT among different therapies. And we have a lot of both available in the IAP services and the outcomes are just as good for counseling as CBT. In anxiety though, 
NICE recommends um, CBT, but not counselling. But in the first year, we had quite a lot of counsellors who were treating generalised anxiety disorder. And they were saying, but we know we do well with this condition. And they were right. The outcome uh, data showed 48% of patients given counselling and generalised anxiety recovered. But what they didn't know until we looked at the data is that the generalized anxiety patients who had cognitive behavior therapy, 58% recovered. And so now the system is much more closely focused on delivering the nice recommended treatment for the particular condition. Um, we also found that um, assessment is very important. So this is an analysis that I published in Lancet where we looked at predicting which services get the best results and which get less good results, and what are the characteristics of the most effective services. And we found that those services whose assessment led to the clinician having a very clear statement about what the main problem is that they would be treating, it's often aligned to ICD-10 codes, but not exactly, we call it a problem descriptor, those services get much better outcomes. We also find that how long you wait to start treatment is important. And you see that on this slide. So each dot is about 5,000 patients. It's the patients seen in an individual IAP service in one year. And uh, what I've plotted here is the mean number of days that patients in that service would have to wait to start treatment. And then this is the percentage of patients who in that service show reliable improvements. And you can see, it doesn't really matter how long people have to wait for the first six weeks. But if your service on average takes longer than six weeks to start people's treatment, then the outcomes are less good, even though the treatments are the same. This led our government to set as a target of starting treatment within six weeks. There is also a dose response effect. Those services who on average give a higher number of sessions get on average better outcomes. Uh, and also uh, with the step care model, it is very important that if people do not respond to the low intensity intervention, you promptly step them up to the high intensity treatment. And those services who did that well and did that quickly get much better outcomes. So it isn't simply which treatment you give that's important. It is also how you organize your overall service. I spent most of my life in psychotherapy research on particular treatments, trying to improve them. So this was a big shock to me to discover that it's just important to get your system of delivery right as it is to have a particular treatment. You get as much public benefit from getting the system right as from the treatment. So what are the other things we've learned from the data? Well, early on, we found we did get a difference in outcome depending on the ethnicity of the patient. We found that uh, the outcomes for uh, white patients was uh, better than for Asian or black patients, which is really not fair. So we worked very hard to try and understand why we were not doing so well with our ethnic minorities. And a lot of it turned out to be to do with access how we pull people into the system and get them engaged in therapy rather than the type of therapy. And we developed a positive practice guideline for black and Asian minority patients so that we could improve the system. And you can see it has worked very well. Now there is no difference in outcome between the white and black population. And uh, the difference to the Asian population is much reduced. 
Of course, all of them have got better outcomes over time, but we've removed the ethnic difference. Um, one of our early findings was that if your service is in a socially deprived area of the country, the outcomes are not quite so good. We showed in my paper in the Lancet that a lot of that is to do with the quality of the service. So if you control for the quality of the service, you get very good outcomes, even in socially deprived areas. And I'd like to show you an example of that. So here I've plotted the recovery rate and the improvement rates for two areas of England, which are next to each other. The first is Windsor. You may have heard of Windsor Castle, where the Queen used to live and now King Charles III lives. And that is not a socially deprived area of the country. But next to it is Slough, one of the most socially deprived areas of the country. But they are both served by a single very high quality IAPT service. And you can see that the outcomes are just as good in Slough as in Windsor. In fact, slightly better. So if King Charles felt that he might like to be seen in an IAP service, we might suggest that he ask the chauffeur to drive him a little bit further along the road to Slough. So one of the great advantages of being able to collect lots of outcome data is you can go beyond conventional research with very large numbers of people. You can look closely at trying to identify the characteristics of people who do least well with our therapies. And that is a, an exercise that is being done at the moment in England. Um, one analysis uh, done by people at University College London, Rob Sanders, has identified a particular mixture of symptoms and other personal characteristics of people, which is associated with particularly poor outcomes, only around about 20% recovery. These are people who have very high scores in anxiety and depression, but also tend to be on state benefits, are more likely to be unemployed and have phobias. So you've got a lot of things happening, haven't you? Um, but once we've identified that group of people, you can start to see if you can improve the system. So in uh, the Oxford area, uh, we have now got the algorithm and we identify at assessment whether you fall into this particular group. And then we have been offering patients in that group, not just the psychological therapy, but also an employment advisor who helps get them back into work or helps them adjust work to make it work with their mental health problems. And what we found is that those patients who accept the employment advice, their recovery rate is now 47%. Those who don't uh, accept it just have the psychological therapy. It's more like what you'd expect, 27%. So we're learning how to pull things together in a psychological and social way in order to get the best benefit from those people who need that integrated care. So that was before this thing appeared and changed everything for all of us. So IAPT was not included in any government plan for pandemics. But we quickly realized that it's offering treatment for the people who have the most common mental health consequences of COVID. So we had to keep the services open, but society had closed. And so we moved within three weeks to complete remote delivery. We issued many thousands of laptops to all the therapists. They all went home. My research group stopped all of its research 
and focused on training the workforce for the next three months. We did lots of webinars, up to 1900 uh, therapists in a webinar, focusing on how to deliver the treatment remotely. This was uncharted territory for us. We didn't know what the outcomes would be, but IAP collects the data so we could find out. First thing to say is, you see, this is the video link. It was only 2% prior to the lockdown, but once we locked down in March of 2020, it greatly increased. So video use up a thousand percent. Also quite a lot of telephone uh, use of the therapy. Face-to-face -face therapy dropped down to just 3% of all sessions in the pandemic. Um, if you want to see any uh, of the training resources that we use to help people deliver them, we have a free therapist resources website um, here, uh, oxcadatresources.com, uh, and you can see lots of illustrations of how to do uh, the remote therapy for different anxiety disorders and depression from our team. Also written guides, how to do treatment of PTSD for people who've been in intensive care with COVID and are now out, but are haunted by the memory. And please do access the website. It's free, anyone can use it. You will join a community of therapists in 141 th uh, countries who are currently using it. And around about 100,000 therapists worldwide are using it. So what was the outcome? Well, you can see actually <laughs> we do just as well. So here is the recovery rate pre-pandemic, we get the lockdown here, we get a bit of a drop for the first two months as everyone's getting reorganized and learning how to do it. But then you can see that we're back to our 50% and above recovery rates and our reliable improvement rates up to 70%. So we have learned from this and in the future, we will deliver more therapy remotely, but we've asked many of the patients who had remote therapy, um, if you were able to come back for face-to-face -face therapy in the future, if you came back, would you want to do that? And many of them say, yes, I would like it still. Um, and also there are patients who do not live in accommodation where you can have remote therapy. They, they don't have a private room. They don't have the, the, the uh, computer for it. There's someone abusive in the home. So we cannot shift to remote delivery. It simply has to be a patient choice. Um, and we are going to require all services to organize their workforce so you do not have to wait longer for face-to-face -face therapy than remote therapy. Because only if you do that is it a true patient choice. So um, sort of winding up, where are things going for the future? Well, one initiative we've been doing is what we call I act long-term conditions. Uh, about 40% of people with anxiety and depression also have a long-term physical health problem, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And in England, those people have not had good care in the past. If they were lucky, they would get an appointment for their physical health somewhere over there, and for their mental health, somewhere over there. And you could guarantee that the person looking after their mental health would not be liaising with the person looking after their physical health. That's some weird form of Cartesian dualism, isn't it? It's not treating an individual. So we try and overcome that by creating what we call integrated IAP services, which bring together your physical and mental health care in the same place. And we now have those new services in 75% of areas of the country, but we're still working on it. And the outcomes are pretty good. So for those people with long-term uh, uh, physical health conditions, as well as their anxiety and depression, the difference in outcomes is, very, is not very different from those who don't have the long-term condition. The argument for IAPT has always been an economic one as well as a clinical one. 
And that is also true for IAPTLTC. So we have, for example, done an experiment where we've made these services available in some areas of the country more quickly than in others. And we've compared the outcomes in those areas where we make them available quickly. And the first thing we've found is that if you create an IAPT LTC service, you save the healthcare system about 360 pounds, which actually is pretty similar, about 400 euros uh, per patient in the first three months of treatment. So it reduces physical healthcare costs. It also actually helps people back into employment or more precisely, if you look at those people in the control areas who don't have the integrated IAP service, then over the period of time, they're less likely to be employed. <laughs> Whereas those people who are in the uh, integrated services, their employment rate goes up. So really strong economic argument for doing this. Lastly, I said there is a dose effect in therapy. So this shows you the uh, average number of sessions people had for the last million patients we treated in IAPT. And as you can see, the average number of sessions per service at the moment is eight. And you can see that uh, therefore a lot of people are getting up to eight or nine sessions, but smaller numbers of people above that, although some are into their twenties. Is that the ideal? Has the system found the right place? Or could we maybe increase the number of sessions and get further benefit? I think the answer is we could increase the number of sessions and get further benefit. So here you see I've plotted the recovery rate and the reliable improvement rate as a function of how many sessions someone has before they're discharged. Lots of people recover with only seven or eight sessions before discharge. But if they don't, and they carry on with treatment, you can see there's still a very good chance of them recovering with some more sessions. And also the reliable improvement rate stays high. So we are now lobbying the government to provide funds to allow us to increase the average number of sessions per service from eight to 10. And we think this will improve substantially the outcomes. It will take us beyond what the research literature shows, interestingly. So this could be an example where routine implementation does better than the research trials. And lastly, of course, we are also exploring including internet therapies uh, in the treatment, because in psychotherapy, you're predominantly learning new skills for dealing with emotional problems. And one way of learning them is in a psychotherapy session with your psychotherapist, but that's not the only way of learning in life. And you can put a lot of the key ideas in an internet program. On their own, they don't do well. But if you're then supported by a therapist who understands the program and guides you through it as well, the research shows you can get good outcomes. And here's an example from my own team where uh, we take an internet a program for social anxiety disorder. And in a randomized controlled trial, uh, we compared the outcomes with the internet program versus face-to-face -face, uh, psychological therapy with real experts. And what we've plotted here is the increasing amount of therapist time uh, in the clinical trial and the social anxiety rating. And as you can see, if you had the face-to-face -face therapy, you uh, get a lot better, big reductions in your social anxiety. The recovery rate is 70% at the end. Um, but every hour of psychotherapy matters because you're getting an, on average, a bit more improvement with every hour. And this is a total of 18 hours. If, however, you put all the ideas in the internet program, but you still have a therapist and they contact you by video link or phone, but for shorter sessions each week, and they see what you've learned and they make further suggestions. So they're using their clinical skills. We find that you get to the same point with only six and a half hours 
a therapist's time. So we are more than doubling the clinical benefit of every hour of psychotherapy time. This, of course, means we can treat more patients. And so that IAPT is going to bring more of these internet treatments in as well, but only as a matter of patient choice, only for those patients who would like to try the internet treatment, therapist assisted, not for those who want traditional face-to-face -face therapy every week. Um, but we have found that was a clinical trial. We have deployed the internet treatment in eight IAP services using the IAP therapist. And you can see the outcomes are identical, more or less recovery rate, 63% in the clinical trial, 60% in routine implementation and improvement rates very similar. So that's really covered what I wanted to say. Um, for me, this has been a surprising journey for someone who spent most of his life just on psychotherapy development uh, to look at systems was a, a new venture. What I've learned from it is firstly, the importance of clinical guidelines. And I see that your uh, consensus conference uh, supports several different clinical guidelines. Um, the importance of national training programs and particularly assessing people's competence at the end of a uh, training. If you want to release money for psychotherapy, spend your time in the treasury, not the Department of Health was my experience. The economic argument is really important. And we have found that collecting the outcome data and publishing it has produced enormous public support and has helped us learn so many things how to reduce the difference in outcomes between the ethnic groups, how to get over the effect of social deprivation on uh, clinical outcomes, how to really get confidence in our clinical guidelines. We, would have learned, we wouldn't have known any of that without collecting and publishing the data. So it's been really important. But of course, what's been most important is the IAPT workforce. We are very lucky to have a very devoted group of 10,000 therapists who really work hard in very difficult circumstances to achieve these goals. Um, it's remarkable what they did in COVID in very difficult circumstances. Um, and in order to do that, they have to feel they're in a system that's worthwhile. And I think seeing the outcomes really helps them with that. But they also have to have innovative leads of all the services who they may be focused on the outcome data but not in some sort of managerial punitive way what's your outcome like but rather in an inquisitive way thinking what can we learn from this how can we improve things even further from where we've got so you have to create an innovation environment that people enjoy working with thank you